You're listening to the Pan American Express here on WECS Radio, broadcasting from the heart of the campus here at Eastern Connecticut State University. And we're about to begin with another one in a series of radio interviews coordinated by the Connecticut Arts Alliance, WECS Radio and Human Arts Media about the arts. My name is John Murphy, and in this series, my guests and I explore the arts and culture community in Connecticut to hear the latest projects, strategies, and impact of the sector on the statewide community. We also want to focus more on having the public learn more about the arts and culture across the state, advocacy initiatives, and how individuals can make an impact to help the arts economy grow, especially after COVID, and we return to whatever is going to be a new normal. Uh, my next interview today, I'm very happy to share uh, the phones with First Selectman from the town of Stonington. Her name is Danielle Chesbro. Welcome to the program, Danielle. It's great to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me. Now, I want to congratulate you as well, just to start off, because this is your first term. You, you were elected last fall. So congratulations and thank you for stepping up to the plate to serve. Oh, thank you so much. It's, it's been an honor. It's been quite the, the year, but uh, I'm, I'm glad I'm here. Well, I want to mention, uh, well, we have several things to cover today, but the most, uh, the most obvious launching pad is your sense of how the arts are doing as the session is continuing in Connecticut and all these bills are coming up for debate, especially the uh, House Bill 6119. Do you have any thoughts on those? I do. I mean, so we're, I represent Stonington, which includes um, a, a large part of, of Mystic, um, which is home to the, the Mystic Seaport, um, which a lot of people know as a large museum, living museum. But we also look at this, I think, regionally. We work really close with our other first selectmen and mayors. And so whether it's the Guard Art Center in New London or the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center in Waterford, you know, we're very concerned about um, how the arts and cultural institutions are going to make it through um, this really, really challenging time. So the House Bill 6119 couldn't come at a better time. Um, and I know for at least for our town, we're fully supportive of this bill. I had a conversation recently with uh, State Representative John Michael Parker about this. Uh, do you have any sense on how it's going as it's been debated and possibly amended and how people may be fine tuning it as they go? Not as of the, you know, as probably as recently as some other folks, but I do know, you know, I think we heard a lot of support um, during um, the, the, te the virtual, as everything is, um, testimony in support of the bill. And I think what stood out to me, and I hope I think resonated with a lot of the legislators, is this is an interesting bill in that while, you know, at its face value, it might look like an additional, you know, tax or expenditure, but really it is a source of revenue. Um, you know, there's such a strong ROI, whether you're looking at kind of the tourism marketing piece or the arts and culture piece, like pretty much every study and not just from Connecticut, but around the nation that has looked at this shows a, such a strong return on investment when you invest in these areas. So that's more money that will be coming into the state, whether through um, state or local taxes um, that are generated, and that could be used in other really important areas of the budget. So, so I do hope we um, this makes it through this session, but I know they have a lot of bills on their plate this year. I know they do, and you know, one of the things that I'm tracking, uh, and I mentioned this with uh, John Michael last time, is that uh, the source of a lot of this revenue is the hotel tax that they have that's established, and it's a matter of shifting some of those tax funds more proportionately to arts, culture, tourism. So it's not so much trying to get new money, but trying to shift existing money over in a larger scale. Exactly. That's right. why I think it's a very clever written bill, um, and it is. And it, it's you know the only reason we're getting that money is because of the hotel tax. So therefore, it right. seems to make sense to put that money back into what is likely bringing people to stay in the hotel in the first place. I wanted to ask you too. In your part of the state, could you do a little comparison of the health and wellness of your regional arts community just before the COVID and what the impacts have been? and what people are coming to you with their hopes for whatever the new normal is going to look like. Yes, no, thank you for asking. So we're part of um, New London County, um, and so they, we're, we are very grateful to the work of the Southeastern Connecticut Cultural Coalition. Um, they do some great work, and they had actually, they've, they've been very um, great with their advocacy and sharing numbers with us. But so looking at New London County, um, we know that the nonprofit arts and culture inventory um, generated about $160 million annually and supports about 5,000 jobs and normally attracts about 3.2 million visitors. Um, this is all before COVID. We don't have the exact numbers of how COVID has, has impacted it as a whole yet, but we do know for Connecticut, looking at just 2020, 
there was about $2.4 billion in lost revenues for the creative economy business, and 57% um, of workers have experienced a drastic decrease in work. Um, so, I mean, this is one of those areas that has clearly been extremely hard hit, especially um, the indoor performing arts centers that are really looking at a longer-term impact as well, since we're not sure what the confidence of audiences will be to come back um, even once they have vaccines or how much capacity they'll have to reduce indoors. I know uh, several of the regional service organizations around the state under the Office of the Arts are doing webinars to help people learn how to reopen safely and what are the requirements, and they're trying to get some funding available to help you with some of those extra costs. Is that helping people that you know of in your area? I believe it is. I think, you know, some of the, the PPP kind of round two will help probably get people another couple months. But, you know, if we're looking at the long term of the, you know, both the reduction in revenue as well as the increases, I mean, some of them are going to have to change their HVAC systems and right. you know, others might have to you know, put in more more simple changes. But, I mean, I think these are, are large investments that we might be looking at. And so we were really grateful. We've been watching the American Rescue Plan bill, as I'm sure everyone has. And we were so grateful to see that there were specific allocations through the National Endowment for the Arts, as well as for the humanities and museums and library services. Um, but obviously, that's competing across the whole country. Um, so we're, we're still concerned about how some of these, especially smaller venues, will be able to weather this. And, you know, I wanted to mention your town website because I saw a nice section there that was very engaging called Community Connections. <laughs> and uh, is short videos that let people know about little hidden treasures they might not otherwise know about. Uh, the website's www.stonington-ct.gov. That's the main website. And there's a section there. That you can find about the libraries and their hours. And there were things about kayaking. Mystic Aquarium was there, community gardens, libraries, nature centers. Uh, you must think people are really using that well, and there's more on the way, I gather. We hope so. We started that in the middle of COVID. We were inspired. Some other communities, um, New London had a, 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 a elected official who was doing them, and then our Ocean yeah. Community Chamber um, president was doing a great job with them. So we thought, okay, what can we do here with, with really no budget, just um, two of us in the office would go out and, yeah, like you said, just try and highlight some more hidden treasures or, or things that people, you know, people obviously are aware of the aquarium, but they might not know about the work they were doing on horseshoe crabs. Or um, similarly, we did, um, like you mentioned, the Pocketuck River, that um, there's an amazing kayak trail that starts a few towns up. So we did try and do that, and we're, we're always looking for new ideas, but the arts and culture are definitely a place where I think um, you know, hopefully people will be able to go more and more to as, as things open or at least be outside with them. Well, fortunately, we're heading towards spring now, so that's going to help everything, that's for sure. It will. It should help everything. Um, and we were, yeah, we've been even thinking about are there things, and we'd love to know what other towns are doing, but to kind of both, you know, give people that, that community connection that arts and culture give um, in a safe way as we kind of ease back, back into opening. You know, as you're doing all this good work, are there any organizations or services that have been very helpful to you along the way or people you work with that you want to acknowledge their support to help us all get through this? Oh, man, there's so many. We, we could yeah. probably spend a whole day on it, but I would say, you know, our chambers of commerce um, have been amazing, and in particular, the Ocean Community Chamber, which um, also serves downtown Westerly in Rhode Island. Um, Lisa Kanicki has just been an amazing force of nature for both um, our businesses, but also our, our nonprofits and organizations. Um, and then, like, Wendy Burry, who runs the Southeastern Connecticut Cultural Coalition, keeps us just very up-to-date and motivated to keep working on things and, and not give up. Um, and then just so many of our you know, local and state teams, but also groups like we're part of the Southeastern COG, Council of Governments. And right. it's just been so helpful. Almost every week we've have these calls where we can just talk with other elected officials and other um, representatives from other organizations just to talk about how things are, are going and run ideas by each other. And, and things like that are just so valuable, especially as a newer first selectman um, stepping into this. So these, these groups have been just amazing. And some of the nonprofits like TVCCA, what, the work that they're able to do on such a small budget to support the mental and physical health of the community. And then I guess the last one I have to mention is Ledgelite Health District. Um, Stephen Mansfield and his team, they're our um, health district for us and, and 10 towns around our community. And they've just done so much above and beyond for, for COVID help. It's just been, it's been heartwarming. 
Well, it's very encouraging because it was a long, prolonged downtime that people can get pretty discouraged, you know. But all the background work behind the scene that's quiet that people will realize is enabling all the good things to be unleashed when uh, we're ready. It's very true. And there's, you know, we have um, a, a local, it's called the Pocket Duck Neighborhood Center. You know, right before we were re- reminiscing because it was a year ago last week that we all had these kind of internal meetings talking about all the different scenarios for the shutdown and right away they came up with our human services department and the school to say you know there's so many kids and families who rely on the school meals so what are we going to do about that and they were so proactive you know just so ahead of the ball of figuring out how to get kids and families um, outside distribution of of food to take home and the schools were going to be shut down and it's things like that that you know exactly you don't necessarily see it happening but if it wasn't there you would notice yeah. And, you know, one other resource I should mention is the Connecticut Arts Alliance. I'm a member of their board along with Wendy from SECT, and there's a number of, of folks across the state from organizations large and small that are trying to cooperatively work to share information and resources to help people move ahead. All the uh, statewide regional service organizations are connected to CAA. If people want to find out in their area what resources are available, about how to open safely, and other kinds of grant programs, the website has a lot of information. It's ctartsalliance.org, ctartsalliance.org. Um, have you worked with them before? I first met you on a special webinar that uh, John Michael Parker did. That's how we connected. Have you done work with the CAA in the past? I haven't. I'm actually writing this down now because we'll look at this and try and share it with, with our community members also. Yeah. yeah, people are finding out about it all the time. ctartsalliance.org. It's a good resource. And uh, in case you've joined us, folks, we're having a conversation uh, today with Danielle Cheesebrow. She's the first selectman in the town of Stonington. And uh, the website I mentioned is www.stonington-ct.gov. And their phone number is 860-535-5050. And one thing that we missed that I want to ask about is one of my favorite days is International Women's Day on March 8th. And uh, you had a big celebration as part of the work of the Commission on the Status of Women. Can you talk about how that event went that day and how you're celebrating women in public life, equal participation in decision making? Um, No, it's so great. I also, I have a a soft spot for this day also. um, In my last job, I got to do a lot of work with um, the United Nations UN Women Program um, on this day, and we would uh, work with local stock exchanges to ring their opening or closing bell to talk about and raise awareness about how important equality is for um, our economies. So I've I've always had an affinity for this day. Um, But this year, obviously, was a little bit different um, being all virtual and with COVID, but we do try and raise um, awareness about the importance and just steps that people can take locally. Um, And like we say, with a lot of these um, international days or or months, it shouldn't be just that day. We should try and keep this work going throughout the year. So on our website and um, social media, we really just try to share some ideas that we had on how people can kind of um, do their part, if you will, but then also we, we love ideas from the community or other communities about what they do, and hopefully next year we'll be able to do even more. Well, you know, as many businesses adapt to the uh, challenges and limitations of the virus situation, when they rebuild and retool, this is the time to integrate new thinking uh, in the new structures as they rebuild. That's hope. Yeah, there is hope, and I think, you know, as we're seeing more and more results come out of COVID, you know, it's also raising more awareness, I mean, about, you know, just how hard hit a lot of females are, whether it's because they're often the caretaker or the person, whether it's you know, children or right. uh, family members, um, and then also just the type of um, work that they're in. Um, so it can be it can be challenging. So I think it's important. It's a great time to kind of review where we've been and then just where we want to go. And, you know, there's one last thing I wanted to ask about while I have you, and it's related to this day, is the Generation Equality Campaign. Can you tell us about that? Yes, no, so we're um, we're just trying to support a bigger effort here. We think the Generation Equality Campaign is just um, really fascinating. So it's um, about, like you said, women in public life, equal participation and decision-making. And I believe it's going to go really all around the world. Um, it's something you and women is trying to, to organize, but it's basically about how women and men, boys and girls, people of all ages, you know, we all have a role to play. And um, it's about, this. you know, this is our time. This could be the generation of equality and how 
how we can advocate for whether it's equal pay, equal sharing of unpaid work um, around the, our house and families, and also obviously addressing sexual harassment and all forms of, of violence against women and girls. Um, so I think it's something you know, everyone can support and we can recognize we all can play a role. So really over the next few months, there'll be act activities happening all around the world, um, mostly again, virtually for, for now, but hopefully um, whether you know, whatever town you're in, Connecticut or around the U.S., you know, we can all play a role in this kind of movement. Right. So people can just do a search and find out more about the Generation Equality Campaign. Well, maybe one last thing before we say farewell, Danielle. I wanted to ask a larger question. From your perspective now, uh, in your town and your region in the state, what is the effect of the arts and culture community on the state as a whole? I think it's so hard to capture in you know, a short segment, but I mean, to me, it's a lot about the quality of life. Um, and I think you almost sometimes won't notice until it's not there, which is unfortunate. But I think so much of what draws people to either visit or want to live in a community goes back to the arts and culture. Um, it's kind of what weaves the fabric of our community together. Um, so I think it's, it's essential. And I hope we can do, I think with the, the silver lining of COVID is I think it's helped a lot of us realize just how important um, this is kind of sec sector is to our communities and hopefully we'll come out of this doing more to support them than, than we maybe even did in the past. Well, I want to thank you very much for your work and, you know, the role that you play in your community to support the arts and all the forms that it exists and to help us with uh, supporting legislation that may come through, especially that House Bill 6119 that people can track. If you search on that one, that's the big bill everybody's hoping for, HB 6119. But thank you for your good work, Danielle Chesbro, and I, and I wish you a good year ahead. And hopefully, uh, perhaps after the session or in the summer, we'll have you back for an update. Oh, anytime. Thank you so much, and have a great week. Take care. Be well. Thank you.